as we continue to build in chapter 15, we've seen John trying to paint a picture. And as, as this is the last event before the, the seven bowls of wrath that God is going to pour out on this earth. And we've been asking the question in the, the series that we are on is what is the purpose of of the great tribulation. Why do we have to go through these different things? What is the purpose? And to, we've seen two different things, and, 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 but today we're going to look at to turn all eyes to Jesus. We live in a time that is challenging. We live in a time that people don't care about Jesus. As a matter of fact, they try to oppose the name of Jesus because that is being too specific. That's not looking at other people's desires and needs it's not looking at other people's places and how they feel but the name of Jesus is what is most important and I appreciate the the first two verses as we look at that. in verse one we saw that the wrath that comes from God the wrath that's going to be poured out by these seven angels with these seven bowls these judgments these these very painful items that are going to take place. And it's going to happen over a period of three and a half years. Uh, I don't know how. And, and Jesus said himself in, in Matthew 24, had the days not been shortened, had it not been set on God's calendar that it would only last for seven years, no one would survive. But because of that, we in verse one saw that this great wrath that God is going to pour out is going to come to an end. Hallelujah. Isn't it good when you're uh, you know, I, I'm always listening when I'm sitting in the dentist chair. Now, I've got dentists on the mind because i got to go to the dentist this next week, and I cannot stand going to the dentist. But I'm always listening or waiting for him to, you know, when they undo that clip and take that thing off the front. Oh, that bib, oh, that's what I'm waiting on. I just, I don't like sitting in the dentist chair. But at the end of the tribulation, we can look forward to an event that is going to transpire, and we're going to be with him if you've accepted the Lord as your Savior. But here's the thing is, Jesus is coming back. That wrath is going to end at his return. And, and then verse 2, we saw the angel, the, uh, the, the, as I said last week, these warrior saints, as they look there in heaven, and they look down at that sea like glass mingled with fire, and it's the battles that are going on during the tribulation. And we see that they've overcome the beast. They've overcome Satan. And we saw last week as we preached this message that we ourselves can have this fight as well. As we stand in heaven and we find ourselves victorious, we see the victory through Jesus. And because of that, we can stand against the world, our flesh, or even Satan himself, and we can have the victory. And that was my challenge last week is to get us to that place. We know that the wrath is going to end, verse 1. We see the victor victory that we can have in Jesus. And we talked about many verses. Go back to your notes and look those over. But we can have victory even today. And because of that, we can better understand what it is that we read here in verses 3 and 4. How is it that we look at Jesus? Now, John, as he's talking here and he brings out these two verses, the, the, the book of Revelation is pointed to the Jews. Now, as we know, the Jews are a group of people, God's chosen, and those are the people in the seed line in which Jesus came to us as a man. So they're very special. And the book of Revelation is pointed a lot to them. I would say the majority is to tell, get them to get to the place that they say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Many Jews today do not agree with that. They still have, you know, if you, you find somebody who is an Orthodox Jew, they will not, they'll talk about the Old Testament. They'll talk about Isaiah. They'll talk about Moses, Abraham, and all these names that we've studied in Sunday school class, but they do not recognize Jesus other than just a teacher. He is, he is not the Son of God. And, I, I, you know, I don't understand that because just so many places in Scripture, the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, write that down on the corner of your bulletin. Go back and read that today. It tells you about Jesus. 400 years before Jesus has ever, before he was even here on this earth. 
we have to understand that Jesus is very true. And we have to know that as John is pointing out to the Jews, but even those that are not Jews, they can see who Jesus is. John, do, do you know who Jesus is? Now, I'm picking on John because I know he knows the answer. Yes, right? And, he's, and he said it in Sunday school this morning. I asked him, I said, why do you come to church? He says, because that's what my life's about. That is what we have to get to the places that Jesus is that important that it doesn't matter what's going on, that your eyes are on Jesus. No matter how your week's going, no matter what's going on that's bad, no matter what war's going on in the world, no matter how hungry you are, how bad you feel, it's about Jesus and what it is that he's doing in our lives. I believe that sometimes we have lost the sight that when we study the book of Revelation, and I said this at the beginning, but that the 65 books that precede the book of Revelation, uh, what is it that it shows us that we need to see about Jesus? Now, keep in mind, I only have 35 minutes. And I can't cover everything, but I've paraphrased this by uh, how do we look at Jesus? Is he your deliverer? Is he your king? And what leads you to want to know more about him? And I believe if there are two verses that point to the Jews, to examples that the Jews could really understand, and that we, as children of God, we look back to the Old Testament. One of the first big names we learn about is Moses. Moses was a deliverer. Would you agree with that? He was the one that went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. He was the one that Pharaoh said, no, I'll not let your people go. And God moved through Moses to do some great and mighty things. He brought some plagues. And we're going to get to that next week. And we're going to see that Moses delivered the children of God, the Hebrew children, out of Pharaoh uh, and Egypt. And Egypt is a type of the world, sin, if you will. But it was Moses that delivered them to the promised land. They just didn't have enough sense to go on in. But he used Moses to deliver them. And then later in the Hebrew lineage, the Jewish people, the next big person or key character in how they believe was this little shepherd boy named David. Now, we all know the story because we live some 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 4, years since. And we've read the stories, not just that he slew a giant, but he became the king. He was God's chosen king for Israel. Not Saul was the people's choice. And I believe that as we saw and we see in Scripture that David was a king. And in these two verses, verses 3 and 4, we see a deliverer and we see a king. But they're not talking about just Moses. They're not just talking about King David. They're talking about Jesus. And I believe that we as people of 2022, we need to see Jesus as a deliverer. We need to see Jesus as our king. And I believe those very important parts. And as we see this, and it says they sing the, they sang the song of Moses, and they saw that this king, O king of the nations, do we understand the acts in which Jesus shows us even greater and more amazing deeds? So I want us to consider something today. I want us to ask ourselves a question. And this is from the newest Christian to the oldest Christian in this room or online, whoever you may be. But what acts have been revealed to you about Jesus? What acts, events, something that transpired in your life, tell you about Jesus? We all know that the Holy Spirit has to draw us to the Lord. Jesus died on the cross. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and dwelt with men, in men. But what is it that draws us other than the Holy Spirit? What is it that makes us want to know more about Jesus? And that's what John's trying to point out in these two verses. The, the tribulation period is to get everybody 
It's, it's, you know, in racing, there's a saying, you either love the driver or you love to hate that driver. Okay, I grew up in the Dale Earnhardt uh, time. And you either liked Dale Earnhardt or you just didn't like him at all. But here's the thing. When it comes to that last day of the tribulation, people are either going to love Jesus, be willing to die for Jesus, or they're going to hate Jesus. And they're going to fight Jesus. What act in your life has shared that to you? Where are you at with that? How are you looking at Jesus? You may say, well, he's a Bible character. He's the answer to all Sunday school questions. Some of you chuckled at that. But here's the thing. Who is Jesus to you? Now, I know this, we're not in the tribulation period, but we live in a time, and if we die today, we're going to stand before Jesus and have to answer for our sins. What acting that has gone on in your life that makes you think about Jesus? Would you be ready to meet him today? That's a good question. You need to be able to answer that today. And maybe we're not going to die, but maybe the rapture take place. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 in the book of Revelation. You remember John said that the Lord says, Come up hither. And the church is drawn out. And we go to be with the Lord. His bride. Before these things, these terrible, terrible things happen on the earth for seven years. We've seen that they're going to come to an end. We've seen that we can have victory even today. But today, I want us to focus on Jesus. Amen. On the back of your bulletins is my outline. If you turn there, turn it over and just take some notes. Write down and answer these questions for yourself. Point number one, Jesus' deeds have been revealed. I'm not saying that it's something that has to be revealed to you. They have already been revealed. Have you received them? If we have the word of God, we have all that we need. We have the canon of God. We have the full scripture. I don't need to go to some prophet today and ask him, what do you think is going to happen? And you prophesy to me, and there's some churches that do this. And they'll sit there and say, well, we have to see and do this. I don't have to go to somebody to do that. I have the entire word of God in my hand. I don't have to look for another book. This is complete. This is, this is the word. John 1.1. 1, 1, John 1.14. I know that this is the word of Jesus. And if this is all I need. Jesus will tell me all that I need to know about him. But not only that. If you're drawn by the Holy Spirit. We can have that. But as we look back to the Old Testament. And we look at Moses. The deeds that he had. He was used by God to do great and amazing deeds. One, he went against the number one empire of the entire world of that day. He went in there to a Pharaoh in which he was already walking on shaky ground because he had killed an Egyptian. He was already wanted for murder and he had come back and they said, Moses, you ain't real bright. You coming back here after what you've done. And what does he say? Let my people go. See, he was there by a higher authority. God Almighty. And he knew that because of that, the Hebrew children in which were in captivity of the world, out of these people would come the Savior, Jesus Christ. Out of these people that would find the Holy Land, they would find their way to Jerusalem and one day to Bethlehem and the Messiah would be born. See, the great and amazing deeds that Moses did were things like parting the Red Sea. These are all things that God did through him. He fed them with manna there in the wilderness. He gave them water to drink out of a rock. He gave them quail because everybody was complaining. Must have been Baptist. Chuckle, chuckle, ha, ha. They didn't like the manna. They said, we need meat. So God gave them quail. Gave them so much quail that it was stacked up and filled a whole valley. We just can't even picture what it looked like. And then he gave them his word, his Ten Commandments. And he tried to give them the deeds in which Moses moved and did great and amazing things. But Jesus does even more so to, for us. He has given us the ability. Jesus is our deliverer. He delivers us from the darkness of the world. 
Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. I love that. I'm, not, I'm a citizen of the United States. I'm a patriot. But you know what? I'm, a king, I'm part of the kingdom of heaven in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. See, Jesus delivers us from not only a dark world and the ways of the world, but as we talked about last week, that we can have victory, but he delivers us to a kingdom. It doesn't just get us out of trouble. You know, the children of Israel, when they were brought out, if had they gone to the promised land and just went there instead of sending in spies to see what the land had, and they, they come back, they sent, how many? How many sent it? There was all but three come or two come back that they said, no, we can't do that. If they'd all just said, God brought us here, let's go. He's given it to us. Later in the story, we find out that after 40 years, they said, well, we kept waiting on you to come. We were afraid to death of y'all because of your God. The giants that they were afraid of were trembling in their sandals. And God gives us that ability through His Son, Jesus, to deliver us from the ways of this world that we don't have to walk in fear. If God be for us, who is against us? See, the domain of this kingdom, or this kingdom in which we are part of, it also is hinged on your looking to Jesus. You say, I'm a, I want to go to heaven. But if you don't have your eyes on Jesus, you haven't ever listened to the deeds of Jesus and what He did on the cross you will not be able to make it. Jesus not only delivers us from the darkness and gives us a, 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 he also gives us a new light to live by. It's one thing to get somebody out of the dark, but to give them a light that they can walk by and to live by and to, to grow and be nurtured by. Any plant that you know, if the sun was to go out and not come back, everything would die, would it not? We have to have light. We have to see what it is that we're doing. But as we see in John chapter 8, against Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You want to, I love it. Do you want to have victory? Have you got the light? Can you see what's around the next corner? You may not know, and I don't know. That's the reason why we're not to lean on our own understanding. And just a few verses in Psalm there, and it says, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I don't need to know where my next hundred yards are. I just need to know my next step. And because of God's word and because Jesus has delivered me, I have the light. I can look and I can see. Without that light, we can, we'll just continue to stumble in darkness and we'll look to Jesus and, and we'll see and have the very light in which God has given us. Because of this new light of Jesus' deeds, we can see the new. You see, sometimes the world, just as Pharaoh, his, his wizards or whatever they were, Aaron threw down the stick, it turned to what? It turned into a snake. Well, their wizards threw down their stick, and it became a snake also. But what happened to their snake? God's snake eat their snake. You see, he led them with that staff. And we have to get to the place that we're willing to be led and delivered by the deeds of Jesus and what he has done versus what we conjure up for ourselves. We might say, well, I've got a good job. I've got, I've got food on the table. I've got good clothes to wear. But are you following the deeds of Jesus? Are you following the deeds that make a difference in someone else's life? Moses didn't want to go to Pharaoh. Moses said, no, I did my tour there. I don't want to go there. I, I, I can't even talk well. Well, I'll send your brother so he can talk for you. But he was still used by God to be a deliverer. Moses did what it was that he'd asked him to do. And Jesus did what he was asked to do. He came and he laid himself upon the cross. He was nailed. He died for our sins. He washes our sins away. But he gives us the light because he not only died for our sins, but three days later he arose in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? I believe that if we follow the deeds of Jesus, we will have this light. We will have the ability to make the next step. 
And then it says in, in 2 Corinthians, as I said, we, we see the new because we are a new creature. In for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Are you a new creature? Have you asked yourself, am I a new creature? Do you live the same way you did yesterday or the day before you got saved? If you're a new creature, you have a new light. You have a new standard in which you go. And it says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Because of Jesus and his deeds, we don't have to worry about old dark world. We've been delivered from the world of sin and the darkness and, and the unknown. Because of the deeds of Jesus, we have a new perspective about not only about eternity, but about life today. I ask you, please, turn your eyes on Jesus. Number two, Jesus, not just Jesus' deeds, but Jesus' ways have been revealed. We see in God's word how he has revealed. In, 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 the, in, chapter, in verse three, it says, just and true are your ways, O king of the nations. See, King David is this, this second character that we're looking at. He was a man after God's own heart. You say, how can that be? Because we know the story. Yeah, he killed Goliath, but there's a lot of things as he become king that he did that weren't very pleasing to God. Ten Commandments were, he about broke every one of them. And I believe that as we look and we try to analyze what it is that we do and we, we look at our deeds, but the problem is we get so caught up in the deeds that we have lost our way in, in Jesus' way. He was a sinner, King David that is. He was a sinner uh, of sinners. But he looked to the triune God to deliver him and change his ways. He did things that were wrong, but he asked God to change him. And what I've tried to do, and he, on your bulletin there, there's in parentheses several verses. I'm not going to read each of those verses, but I took scripture and I, I had an old Bible friend that I, he used to do this all the time. And it struck me as I was going through some of these verses. But can you imagine what this conversation was like? David is talking to God. He knew who God was. And he looks to God. And he said, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. And because of that, he prays a very simple prayer. And he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. You know my ways, what it is that I do. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous, and I like what the King, King James says, wicked. Because if it's not righteousness of God, it's wicked. It find that there's no wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting lead me show me how to live give me the ability to say yes you are my lord i'm going to follow you you're going to deliver me out of the darkness but i need to follow your ways not my ways oh what a day it would be if we would ask god to do that for us you see we don't want to listen to what god has to say and i went on and i found some more verses and here's how God answered David. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you, by testing you may discern what is my will that it is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, the conversation we need to have in Jesus is not only that he would deliver us from our, our problems of life, when we look to Jesus, it shouldn't be as the genie in the bottle that we like to pray. Jesus, help me with my health. Help me with my job. Help me with my finances. Help me with whatever. But help me to change my ways. 
See, G David was a little shepherd boy. All he knew how to do was protect sheep. That's his raising. That's what he did. Even one of the brothers were there fighting in the Jewish army. And they heard about Goliath. Dad said, David, go take some cheese to your brothers. They're fighting a fight. But you see, David had a different look at things. It wasn't about where he was in life. It was about the almighty God. And he says, who is this Philistine who speaks of my God like a dog? Give me the sword. I'll go slew him. How many of us are willing to take that attitude toward the devil in this world? You see, our ways are not changed because we don't allow God to speak to us. Our ways are not His ways. And even on our good days, when we're doing everything for Jesus, I still think sometimes we're very small compared to what God wants to do through His body of believers. I think sometimes our ways don't really line up with His ways because we have to analyze everything. I'm not qualified. I believe David wasn't qualified to slew a giant. He went and got a few rocks out of the brook. Took his sling. Things he'd used in that, in that little field out there protecting sheep. Oh, by the way, he killed a lion and a bear at this, with those things. So he took out this giant. And then took his own sword and cut his head off. And the Philistines flew from a little teenage boy. Do we ask God to change our ways in a way that we look to Jesus? Or do we want to do everything and then ask Jesus to bless it? You see, Jesus wants us to do the things. And he, what he's going to do is he's going to deliver you from this world. He wants to clean you up. He wants to clean all this nastiness off of us and help us to see that we can have a better life if we will live by his righteousness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those things that we do that are wicked and against God, he gives us the ability to be delivered from our own pitiful ways. The ways that we look to Jesus and ask him to show us, his ways are impossible for us to do on our own. Just like he, God told David. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I got big plans for you. But you got to do it my way. And Jesus has given us that ability in Ephesians 2. But it's a gift. It's something that he gives us. And all we have to do is be yielded to his way. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. You believe in Jesus. You'll trust him with your never dying soul. You'll ask him to take you to heaven, but you don't ask him to help you here to here today. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. We have to get to the place we look to Jesus. We have to get to the place that his ways are our ways. And if we stumble and don't do it right, we'll go back and try it again. And we'll keep going back and doing it again until we get it right. Our problem is we'll say, I'm sorry, forgive me, and then we'll just dive back into the mud. We need to let him clean us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The ways of Jesus, oh, thank you, Lord, are patient. I'm glad we serve the God of second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. Amen. I ran from God. I did it wrong. I did it my way. I did it my way. That old, uh, whoever it was that used to sing that. Italians here know who I'm talking about. I don't want to say his name. I did it my way. And when we get to heaven and we see Jesus and we understand his deeds and his ways, we'll say, I wish I'd have done it your way. You see, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but his patience towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, repentance is when we see that we've been delivered. Repentance is when we say, your ways are better than my ways. And we repent and go and follow Jesus. And we put our eyes upon him. 
And lastly, number three, we looked at the deeds of Jesus. We've looked at the ways of Jesus. But Jesus' name has been revealed. The last part of verse four, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? It's a question. It's a question that we need to understand. Do we fear what happens if we don't allow Jesus to deliver us? Do we fear what it is that God is trying to show us through His Son, Jesus Christ? Do we understand and move in a way that we have this understanding of His delivering us and how He wants to be our King as King David was to the Jewish people? Let us just take everything to a new level with Jesus. You see, the problem that we have is that we look at this world and the things that we're in right now. You see, the, the Lord wants to deliver us from the ways of the world. Isn't that what He said? Don't worry. I have conquered the world. He wants us to follow His ways. And the way He does that, He says, I've given you the light. I'm going to pass the baton to you. It's up to you to manifest my body. I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. Amen. He's coming back to get us. But what are we doing? Are we looking at the deeds? Are we following his ways? That we can look at the name of Jesus and say, yes, he's worthy to be followed. Yes, he is my savior. Yes, he is my king and my Lord. I don't care what the preacher says. I want to be more like Jesus. I don't care, you, whoever that one Christian in your life is just above all Christians, Jesus is above them. Stop looking at man. Stop looking at the deeds and the ways of man. Stop looking at the ways and the deeds of the church. Start looking at Jesus. You'll find your way when you do that. That's why we've got a lot of people not in church today. These chairs are empty. I know it's Mother's Day. But Jesus on the cross said, Woman, behold thy son. Yes, she was, he was talking about John, but he was also talking about himself, the Savior of the world. We don't look at Jesus and His name and how powerful it is. The name that brings deliverance. In Acts 4 verse 12 it says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Delivered. Shown how to live a life. Have you turned to Jesus for your deliverance? Does the name of Jesus bring to you a new kingdom? Is this kingdom, this world that you live in now, is it more important than what's going on in heaven? Is your focus on your heavenly kingdom and what you can do to grow it here on earth? Or are you all about today and you? You see, the name of Jesus says we're part of a bigger kingdom than this world ever thought about being. And on this day that John's talking about here at Revelation, as we look forward to the second coming of Christ, Jesus left. He ascended to heaven. And, he said, and the angel said, why are you looking up into the skies? Go share what you know. Share the deeds of this man, Jesus. Share the ways of Jesus. Because he's coming back. Be busy. Get busy. But remember Jesus. You see, without Jesus, we don't have anything. See, the name that brings that new kingdom gives us something to look forward to. And we, had, we, we, we celebrated baptism the other day. Romans 6, start with verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Have you turned to Jesus because you have a new citizenship? The ways of this world are not your ways. It's more important to please Jesus than it is your brother, your sister, or anybody else in this world. But this name should also bring us reverence. It should bring us reverence. It should bring us to a place that it's not about whatever Jesus did for me. 
It's not that he saved me from my sins. It's not that he shows me his ways. When you think about going to heaven, what is it you think about? Is it the streets of gold? I see so many people say, I can't wait to see my mama. And this would be a good day. I wish I could talk to my mama. Angela was right. If you've got a mama that's living, you make sure you call and love up on her. You don't have to call her in nativity. She's right in the next room. If your mama's around, you hug her. Maybe your mama's not around. Maybe there's a lady that stands out. Give her a hug. But here's the thing. When I get to heaven, I'm not looking for my mama. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to look for the streets of gold. When I get to heaven, what I want to see is Jesus. The one who died for me. Who saved me from all the terrible things that I've done in my life. That I continue to do because I'm not smart enough to follow his ways. The way he has laid them out in his word. I think my fault in yours too if we're honest. Is that we lose the place of Jesus in our lives. We sing that song. Oh how I love Jesus. Do we? Do we love him in a way that we turn from anybody else. To do his will in our lives. I look forward to seeing Jesus. And the way my old body is, and like some of you guys, I'm getting closer and closer. And I look forward to seeing Him. I'm ready to go today. The only reason I'm here is because there's somebody that needs to hear the name of Jesus. I asked you a question a while ago. What acts have been revealed to you about Jesus? What are the things that stand out in your memory of Jesus? What is it that stands out when you hear the name of Jesus that popped to mind? My conclusion is the last part of our passage today. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. When Jesus returns, those of the devil will be taken out of the picture. And we are going to live a thousand years with Jesus on his throne there in, in Jerusalem. The temple will be there. We will worship him. We will serve him. We will do the things that have to go on. This world is going to continue on. It's just devil and all his followers are going to be gone for a little while. But we got to live our lives for Jesus. And it's because of that. This passage in, 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 in Revelation 15 shows us that every eye will turn to Jesus. There'll be people that aren't saved yet. Now that's hard to understand. But during the millennial reign, there are going to be people that need to be saved. But when Jesus returns, all eyes will turn to Him. You see, we're talking about why we have the great tribulation. Show that the wrath will end. The day Jesus returns, the wrath ends. Number two, that we have victory in Jesus. See, when he comes, he's coming on a white charger, not on a little old donkey. He's going to come into Jerusalem. He's going to, he's going to come in on that big charger like a big knight. And we're going to be right there with him. He's going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. We'll have the victory and we're going to rule and reign with him. I look forward to that. But when he returns, it's, it's going to be not just that humble deliverer that he came the last time, laid in a manger. No, he's coming back to be the king. Have you been delivered by Jesus? Have you turned to him? Have you thought of who Jesus is in your life? The psalm that Carol read, Psalm 34, verses 4 and 5, says, I sought the Lord. Sounds like David. I know this God. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. You don't have to live in fear. You can live a life of strength and power and victory. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces 
shall never be ashamed. I look forward to seeing Jesus face to face. And as Thomas, I look forward to seeing his nail scarred hands. I believe the wounds are there. I don't think there's scars. There's nowhere that it says scars in the Bible. I believe the wounds are open. I believe they're there today as a reminder of what He did for us. Does Jesus mean that to you? Think about it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your love, Your patience with us. I pray that You would tug on our hearts. One, for that one that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that you would draw them to yourself through your Holy Spirit. I pray that today would be the day they would get saved. You did everything that we have to have there on the cross of Calvary. You washed our sins away. But thank you that three days later, he arose. Jesus arose victorious over death. We don't have to die anymore. We can be born again. And Lord, I thank you for that work that you're doing in those hearts maybe somebody online i pray that they would just reach out and let us share the scripture that they need to hear to know what it is to be saved but lord many of us here today are, are saved many of us here today know who jesus is we know that he's our deliverer he know, we know his ways we know far too much that it is not our ways but lord help us to change help us to move our our focus point off of ourselves and make Jesus the reason we live. Just like the, the rich man there, that Jesus can come and he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And he turned to this young man and he said, sell all that you have and follow me. And the man's left with his face on them because he was not willing to sell and I don't think he really wants us to sell everything that we have but I think he wants us to turn our eyes off of ourselves and our possessions and to place them wholly on your son Jesus do that for us today convict us move us in a way that we do turn our eyes to your son Jesus and I ask all this in Jesus name Amen